Cool. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Connor Rusumano, uh, co-founder and CEO at OpenBCI. Uh, and I'm really proud to, to welcome uh, everybody here and, and excited to get this thing kicked off. Um, we have a really awesome uh, group of panelists here uh, who you know, have incredible uh, backgrounds and expertise and, and a lot to say on, on the topic today. Um, and, you know, we also, you know, despite the, the stuff that we're going to talk about, we do want this to be, you know, an interactive experience and we want people, the attendees that are here right now to feel free to ask questions and, 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 and participate in the conversation uh, to the best of your ability. Um, but yeah, so um, it's really exciting and, you know, uh, Poppy and Guillermo and, and Graham and Kif, it's, it's really an honor to be, to be sharing this, uh, this virtual panel with you guys. You know, I, I respect all of your work and I followed the, the stuff that you guys do for a long time. So it's exciting to be up here with you. Um, so before we get started on the conversation, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share uh, a couple slides uh, of a survey that we ran. Uh, we polled about 650 people uh, and the split ended up being uh, almost exactly 50% men and women uh, between the ages of 80, 18 and 60. Um, and uh, basically the, the questions were focused around biometrics, technology, data privacy, uh, and, and so on. And so we just jump right into it. Uh, let's see, I think it is this guy. Let me know if you can see it. And I'm gonna go into full slideshow mode. Oop, let's jump back a slide. All right, closing the loop. Delivering on the promise of BCI while protecting brain privacy. Um, can you guys see this all right? I can see it. Okay, cool. Um, great. So the first question was, do you use any devices that use biometrics to unlock or log you in? Uh, and do you feel more or less secure using biometrics or traditional type in passwords? Um, this was a good question. 85% uh, said that they do use devices that leverage biometrics already. And 53% that they said that they do feel more secure using biometrics, which is you know, kind of the flip of a coin. Um, let's keep moving. So we asked, uh, and the questions are at the bottom of the slides, but we, we asked, would you be more or less likely to use a device that specifically used your biometric signals, biological signals to improve device performance or improve your mental health? 69% um, said they were more likely to use 16% said less likely and 23% were unsure. So then we got to brainwave specifically. And if at any point, you know, anybody wants to jump in and ask a question or, or point out something that's interesting, please do. Um, we asked, you know, how interested are you in using a device that could read brain, read your brain activity and improve the experience based on that? 73% said that they were interested uh, while 23% said not interested and 8% said not sure. Um, but, you know, despite the promise and the exciting aspects of using uh, brain machine interfaces, uh, there are, you know, some, some ethical uh, and, and, and data privacy concerns. So we asked the question, how concerned are you about using your electronic devices uh, for reading your biometric signals? 17% said they were extremely concerned while 72%, and that includes the 17%, said that they were concerned versus 28% of people being not concerned at all. Um, you know, and that's, that's pretty telling. You know, almost three quarters of people are concerned about the use of biometric data um, in technology. And this, you know, we asked the same question, except specifically uh, alluding to or referring to brain data, uh, not, or brain waves, not, specific, not just generally biometrics. And you can see that the numbers increased overall. So people are actually more concerned, here's the previous slide, uh, about brainwaves being used. Uh, so then we got into kind of, um, you know, we, we try to map this to companies and, and try and gauge people's concern uh, relative to comp companies and institutions. And we asked the question, how concerned are you with the following companies having access to biometric data like pulse rates, fingerprints, facial recognition, et cetera. Um, and as you can see here, uh, Facebook is the winner. Um, may, you may or may not be surprised by that, but you can see that as you go down um, this list from left to right, uh, interestingly enough, uh, people actually trust the government 
more than a lot of these, uh, you know, major consumer technology companies. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's surprising that people trust their doctor more than the government or, you know, the, the consumer tech giants. Um, but I do think it's interesting to point out that, you know, the two least trusted companies here are companies whose revenue models are based on advertising. So here were some of the quotes. So I'll let you guys read through these, but um, you know, these were what people were concerned about you know, and the government will track and control people or Facebook, Amazon, and Google are just not to be trusted with that much data. Um, but we will share this and, and uh, you know, make a blog post about it and you guys can look into it because I thought this was a really interesting uh, uh, study here. Um, so when we ask the same question about brainwaves specifically, not biometrics generally, um, you can see that people overall were uh, even more concerned. Ironically, Facebook, uh, uh, the, the people that were not concerned increased. Um, maybe it's because Facebook has already publicly spoken about building BCIs, um, or maybe it's just that we didn't collect enough data. But you can see that once brainwaves get into the mix, people are uh, more, more concerned about the collection and use of, of their data. So, um, cool. We then asked the question, how interested would you be in using a device that could read and understand your brain activity to create new experiences? Um, and 73%, almost three quarters of people are interested in that. You know, and so, um, you know, I think what that leads us to or the kind of the framing of this conversation that we're about to have is that, you know, people already know that they use biometrics. They're also interested in using biometrics. They're more concerned, they're, they're more interested and more concerned about the promise of BCI relative to biometrics in general. So, you know, I think, you know, with great power, great responsibility, I think there's, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of promise for the integration of, of multimodal BCI and biometrics into, you know, kind of the next technological paradigm. But, um, you know, with that comes additional concerns. Um, yeah, and so here we have, you know, which of the following concerns you most about consumer companies and devices having access to your brainwaves. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, people are more, more concerned about their data being sold than having their mind controlled. Uh, and maybe it's because those two topics are, are connected. And, you know, as your data gets sold, it's getting sold to optimize content for you. So in a way, it, it, it is controlling your mind. Um, but yeah, you know, I think th these are the, the, the responses. And uh, from there, pop back out. That was the last question on the slide, or the last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I would like to now introduce Kif Leswing. Um, Kif is a reporter at CNBC, um, and he also is a, a good friend of mine from high school, which was a coincidence because our, our PR team, Clarity, reached out to him not knowing this. Uh, and then when he found out that it was a, a panel for OpenBCI, he was uh, you know, eager to, to participate. But uh, Kif, uh, I'd like to introduce you and uh, you know, kind of let you take it from here. Oh, you Hi, everyone. I was muted. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be on this panel with you guys. Uh, you know, one of the first things that I, I noticed, uh, you know, and wanted to participate in is that this is called closing the loop, which was kind of a new concept for me. But, you know, maybe in the BCI space, people have a better understanding of what it means. So, you know, uh, I would like the panelists to speak in their own words, you know, what they think closing the loop is and, and what are some of the practical uses of this technology. Let's just set the stage here. Connor can start. Sure. Um, closing the loop. So, you know, the term closed loop computing or, or kind of closed loop BCIs is, is, is a phrase that's used commonly these days. Um, and what it means is uh, kind of this two-part system where you have the human mind or you know, mind and body as one node in this system, and then a computer that has some machine learning algorithms or some type of processing that is recording data from the body or from the mind or from the user and then using that information to optimize or change experiences that get put back you know, into the display or the audio that the user is perceiving. And so in a sense, you're closing the loop between 
the man in the machine, uh, which leads to the opportunity for feedback loops. So, you know, if, if you're familiar with, you know, constructive or, or destructive interference patterns in, in physics, you know, this is the kind of thing that is already happening uh, uh, kind of subtly uh, with, with technology in, in low fidelity, but I think over time it's going to, uh, you know, the, the capabilities of these closed loop systems are going to become um, really incredible. And I think this is something that's both exciting, but also kind of terrifying as we think about, you know, who, who has control over these loops and how much agency do you have as a user? <laughs> undone. Uh, I was just going to say, I often talk about it as empathetic, you know, a broader class as empathetic technology, which is not just ner the neural responses, but also, you know, the proxies for, you know, intent and success of, you know, how, how the body's interacting with the technology and closing the loop, modifying the technology based on the amalgamation of those different signal proxies, um, which Connor's just described. Simple example being, you know, a thermostat, even the most intelligent thermostat in the market does not know if I'm hot or cold, what my intent is in a, you know, at a particular moment in time and how that technology can modify based on my, the amalgamation of my bio, biophysical responses to improve my and optimize my, my environment and moreover, my success, my body's, like how my body is behaving and my cognitive capacity for that moment in time. So how do I leverage that intersection with the technologies around me? Cool. Uh, is Guillermo Graham, up next or is it me? It, it, either one. You know, I know you guys have lots of thoughts on this. This is this is the big question, right? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know one one of the most interesting things about, and this is sort of, I think um, Poppy and Connor and Guillermo and I have all come to this conclusion after a number of years working in the space, um, is that uh, there there um, you know, a lot of the neurotechnology that's come along, and a lot of the neuroimaging stuff, and especially a lot of the research the things that have come out of universities. Um, they're, they're very much open, sort of open questions like, you know, are we finding this effect? Can we build a classifier on this? And that's where the question ends. So um, to, in order to make neurotechnology really useful and more widely adopted, I think it really requires that um, you take these outputs and you connect them back to, um, in, in, some, in some useful way to um, an actionable, either software action or mechanical action or feedback to the user. So we know a lot now about you know, what these brain imaging technologies and what brainwave and optical and acoustic technologies can, uh, can really show us about the brain, but making that information useful uh, to end users, whether it's you know, to perform an intentional voluntary action um, or to make their lives easier by improving uh, their interaction with technology or even just in the purpose for the purpose of research, which is I think what a lot of uh, a lot of the market that uh, that OpenBCI has developed, uh, certainly they're the leaders in the space in you know building um, useful low cost research tools that can then be used for user experience research, for human computer interaction research, for VR research, uh, and make you know sort of make these products and games and interactions and software better just uh, by closing the loop in, in user research. So like within a laboratory, within a software development environment, so that that would be my take on it. Okay. Guillermo, do you have thoughts? Yeah, um, since all my panelists took all the seminal answers for this type of question, I'm going to take it from another perspective, and in which is uh, this idea of uh, data and, and privacy and where is data being moved from one end to another end, right? So there's this closed loop also on like the, gener the data that you're generating the data being transmitted to some sort of pipeline, a third uh, party service, and then what the user is seeing. In many times, uh, in the majority of cases with a lot of the devices that we have, we don't know where this data ends, where uh, who is actually processing and how they're processing these algorithms, the data. You just get some sort of notification, but as a user, you are not part of the um, um, dialogue uh, awareness, uh, and add any other adjectives to being aware of what this type of data is being moved. So I think a lot of the work and the things that we're looking is into how do we bring that conversation and that ownership into the data as well and to uh, the algorithms, transparency on the algorithms that we're using, how we replicate our studies 
And um, so then we can be more aware into how we're responding to a lot of the things that the other panelists were talking about, how we respond to something that is being elicited by one of our emotions or by a, a arousal or whatnot. Yes, but why, why am I responding to this? What is triggering those things? In many cases, where there's not enough transparency on that. So we can talk about uh, closing the loop from that sense as well. Cool, cool. Um, awesome. Great, great job setting the table. Uh, you know, I think this is really interesting. I just got a Slack message. And even though I'm, I'm here with you guys now, if you, you could have seen me, I would have some, there would have been some biometrics that, that, that shot off at that exact moment. Um, I, I wanted to ask about, you know, now that there's closing loop, let, let's talk about applications. I've talked to people in the BCI space that say, you know, these kind of applications can help our physical and mental health, you know, by do, nudging people in certain ways. Do you think that's realistic? You know, do you think that's a realistic goal for this technology? And is that near term or long term? And, and you know, how specifically, what would a nudge like that be like? We can That's for everyone. everyone. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got to ask. We don't have more to go in questions. order. We can kind of, if anyone wants to jump in, feel free. Um, you can start with simple applications that I think no one would have. A, a, don't cross into. You know, I, I like to start with innocuous applications where you start thinking about it, and it's like, how is that going to benefit someone or, or destigmatize a community um, or usage of a technology, like a hearing aid. You know, I'm in a noisy environment, my cognitive load has changed, and you've got a microphone on a device, you know the context of the environment, therefore, because you, you know, you're picking up on, you know, changes in intensity of voices, the presence of voices, you know, and again, it's all the pairing of the, the, the types of sensors that OpenBCI enables with machine learning and AI and, and think, you know, what we can do to understand the context of the environment with those other sensors. So you suddenly have a closed loop interaction where you can increase, you know, the level of dialogue in a noisy environment for an individual. You've now destigmatized use of a technology that's highly beneficial to um, you know, someone engagement. Um, it, it, allow, you know, it allows them to, it allows the user interface to be you know, uh, a continuous and you know, um, Guillermo, you may have a, a way of, that, of how you like to describe it, an interface like that, but the, the ramifications are enormous because it suddenly you have you know encouraged you know the hearing loss is a place where if i don't use a device you get a lot of um cell death uh more rapidly it's it's like one of the you know your sensory system responds to not having that innervation so it's a place where you want people engaging with a peripheral you know with a device sooner than later that's going to help them down the road and we know that leads to a lot of positive mental health and cognitive benefits so like, how do you destigmatize these things? Oh, you know, the, these types of close loop interactions are, are integral. I, I think you know, one thing I would add to that is that um, the, uh, so before I, uh, uh, before I, I uh, uh, was doing what I'm doing now, I used to work for uh, Muse, which is one of the, I think more successful uh, wearable and low cost neurotech companies um, in the space. And you know, most of Muse's adoption uh, was uh, by people who were actively seeking, in a sense, a nudge. Uh, so this was, uh, if you look at the, the, the long history of Muse, it started out as almost an active BCI company. Um, and it, it gradually evolved until it found a market niche that was very effective, it was very effective at, uh, uh, at uh, inhabiting, uh, in which you know, the, the founders of the, the company accidentally taught themselves meditation, trying to learn to control the BCI. Uh, and they realized, in fact, this is the product we've built. It's a meditation teaching tool. Uh, now, the science has recently caught up with or caught up with this uh, in the sense that there are now a couple of papers that have come out and said that mindfulness practitioners are much more effective at, at uh, controlling BCIs. And that if you train them for mindfulness, you'll be better at controlling a, an active BCI. Uh, but even just you know closing that loop, turning it back on the user and giving them that insight uh, as to mind wandering, which is a very simple thing that EEG can do relatively well, um, be created a very useful tool uh, in the sense of like enhancing user wellness. Now the challenge, of course, is that um, as with all sort of quantified self technologies, adoption is principally by the worried well and principally by sort of you know high income earners who 
don't have as much to worry about. So I think one of the biggest challenges for the space is finding ways that we can create useful applications uh, for the people who really need the benefit the most um, and disseminating that. Graham, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? Because uh, if uh, yesterday was a big announcement, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to. So, uh, so uh, recently we announced a new product. I work with, uh, I'm a co-founder and chief scientist with a company called System2 Neurotechnology. Um, and we just announced our product, which was certainly informed by what we learned from Connor and uh, OpenBCI over the years and observing OpenBCI from our purchase within Muse and uh, moving on to, uh, to building something along the lines of uh, the ultra cortex uh, but adding some new innovations. So um, one, of the, one of the major innovations I think that we're seeing in, in neurotech and wearable neurotech now is that other imaging modalities are finding their way out of the laboratory and into the commercial neurotech space. Uh, and the one that we saw the opportunity to create was something called near-infrared spectroscopy. So we shine uh, infrared lasers into the, the scalp and that measures blood oxygenation. So oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, we can derive those measures. Uh, that gives us essentially what the bold signal is in fMRI. Um, so we can see uh, neurovascular coupling when the neurons are activated, they cause the, the capillaries and arterioles to dilate uh, and that brings more blood and then oxygen is pulled off the, the uh, blood cells. So you can see that metabolic process, which is uh, a little bit different from EEG and electrical brain imaging. It gives you a sort of a higher signal to noise, but slower and more localized uh, imaging. Of, of brain activity. Uh, so it's particularly useful for cognitive things, prefrontal. So we've built a system, uh, see if I can get it to come up. Uh, in any case, those of you who are curious can go uh, have a look at System 2 Neurotech. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, and we have uh, optical imaging systems built into the forehead and then these electrical EEG uh, system over the, the entire head. So um, we built this really for closed loop BCI applications, uh, which I think we think is for now is a niche, uh, you know, in much the same way as uh, Galia is, uh, is dedicated toward VR and neuro gaming and uh, closed loop BCI applications. Uh, so we're, uh, we're building towards uh, bringing f into this space. Uh, and, you know, we've had very productive discussions with Connor and his team on, on, uh, on how to go forward in the space and, you know, where there are opportunities to collaborate. So we're excited that, um, not just FNIRs, but other kinds of modalities are finding their way into the closed loop and passive BCI space. This, this I have a good. question, Graham. Are you able to talk about any of the applications, you know, cognitive applications of your partners going forward, you know, in the near term that you're excited uh, about? I'd be, I'd be more than happy to, but I think we, we if we cover Galia, ours is like sort of an addendum on that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like we can do stuff. We can do, we can do stuff that Galia can do, uh, not to the same extent and not in the same way. And then we do some a couple of things slightly differently. Um, so it's really uh, we're complementary technologies to to uh, what both BCI is building. Yeah. Are these are these new modalities that come out of the lab? Are what are they measuring? Are they measuring attention? Are they measuring stress? Are they measuring focus? I think in a lot of cases we don't know yet, and that's that's kind of what's exciting. I think that there's promise, and there is you know we we, we do know that EEG can be used you know, with a certain level of efficacy to determine, you know, certain high level mental states. Um, but, you know, we're still kind of in this sandbox state with, with a lot of these, this hardware. And, and I think like, you know, the world, the software engineers of the world need the new hardware to be able to put it through its paces and, and really determine what applications can be built on top of that hardware. And I think like, What's exciting about System 2, Neurotech, and, and Galia is this idea of multimodal. You know, I think Graham, Graham brought this up. And, and I, like, oftentimes, I, I, I don't even, like, I kind of begrudgingly use the word BCI now because it implies a brain-computer interface. But I, like, there's a piece of me that wishes we had called our company Open MCI because what we're really looking for is the human mind. Like, we're looking for information or, 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 or data that can give us some, even if it's a low fidelity impression of a mental state or, a, you know, that's what we care about. We don't really care about the brain itself. We care about what, you know, the, the software or consciousness that's existing inside of the system, you know, and why it's doing what it's doing and why we're making decisions the way that we are. Um, you know, and I think that over the six years of running OpenBCI, I've realized that EEG is cool, but it's, it's actually 
you know, it has limited value by itself and it really needs to be used and looked at in context of other types of data. And that was a huge impetus for why we started building Galia is that I was like, we need way more data. And I don't mean like way more EEG data. We need different types of data to, to, to cross compare against the EEG to, to try to, to make some of these more important inferences. Um, so yeah. what, one thing before we move on, I want to address Kif's question because I think it's a really good one. Um, you know, what are we measuring is a question that uh, maybe some neurotech companies haven't asked enough when they, when they set out, like you can be a, you can have a very sort of open-ended approach like open BCI has had, um, and you can discover a whole bunch of different applications. Uh, whereas with uh, uh, a lot of neurotech companies and a lot of sort of hackathon types and engineers, uh, there's, there's an enthusiasm that drives the, uh, the innovation and drives the creation of these tools that is a little bit divorced from cognitive neuroscience. So um, bringing these two fields together, bringing the engineering and the technical skills together with people who know a little bit about human psychology and cognitive neuroscience, and that's happening more and more in psychology departments and engineering departments, but it's a super important one because to a certain extent, neurotech and cognitive science have been uh, not so much motor, motor neuroscience, but cognitive science have been parallel solitudes. Uh, so knowing how it is that you want to characterize what you're trying to measure and conceptions around how people experience, you know, these different mental processes uh, is very important in advancing the technology and getting it right when you're trying to build something that's going to have broad application and usability. One awesome. Thing, I, I think that's a great comment because, uh, you know, I go back to Muse and the applications of Muse where, where, I mean, we used it extensively in my class at Stanford that I would teach where, you know, for, as a game, you know, for control of video game, you know, game development. And, you know, any application, the one thing that I think is really important is you, you're asking, what is it measuring? So independent of the physiological responses, how someone solves the task to make the device behave in the way that they that they want it to behave within that environment, that constraint is going to be driven by different individuals in different ways, depend you know, with the limited information they, that that the sensors are picking up. And so, that's where two things come that become really critical, and it's personalization and the the ways that you normalize the behavior of those sensors to the individual for the use cases that you're trying you. Know, and then essentially. You, you, there's there's um, successes and failures in so many different uh, directions with what you do with those continuums of data, right? And then the second thing is how you amalgamate it with other sensors to disambiguate what that response and what that intent might be. And you know, they, like when we think about proxies, I love the the title of this where we're talking about neural ethics, and you know, there's a lot of uh, I think interesting motivations happening because of what happened in Colombia and such and thinking about neural ethics. But you know, the, the voice is such a rich proxy to so many of these signatures that when paired with them becomes a very uh, you know, strong way of disambiguating, but also you know, um, exposing <laughs> a lot of um, uh, you know, data that, that similarly does not have the right uh, ethics, you know, that does not have the right um, uh, privacy structures around it at this point in time. Cool. Now, now we're getting into a little bit of the meat here, and there are some really great questions coming in from the audience that we're going to get to in just a second. But I wanted to ask, you know, uh, now we're talking about ethics, it seemed like according to the study, uh, people are a little more less comfortable with advertising and advertising is obviously, you know, a big part of the digital economy today. Do, ha, have you guys thought about, you know, if advertising and, you know, attention uh, has a place in this open BC, in, not open, in this brain controller biometric world, you know, as you guys are building your systems, do you think there's a place for advertising here? Or do you think that, you know, that may be hijacking some of, some of the signals that, that maybe people don't want to give up? It, that's, neural, that's a panel question. Neural <laughs> marketing is a huge business. So <laughs> Connor, I mean, we, we use it, it, you know, it's going to be in, in yeah, become very, I'm curious for Graham and Guillermo's and Connor's. Uh, if, yeah. if, if, is everyone familiar with neuromarketing on this call and, and the use of P300s for, you know, extracting these sort of subconscious associations? 
you know, it can be very powerful for branding, but it has a lot of positive applications. You know, it, it identifies a mode of valence associated with, with content. The site can identify, you know, new demographic uses. So the idea being you're looking for P300 responses, maybe associated with certain adjectives that might, you know, you might be a, you know, flashed prior to a very complex, you know, multi-dimensional experience. And you're able to, you know, identify through, you know, fairly simple, you know, uh, uh, assessments, ways of pulling out what the strongest associations were with a with a multidimensional experience. It, there uh, are huge, like, you know, it's like it, the huge applications to that for bad and for good. Uh, and, you know, and Nielsen uses it quite a lot. So I have an interesting anecdote on this front where, um, you know, I got really uh, angry at just, you know, tailored ads in general. And so I went into Twitter and I went in and modified all my settings so that they couldn't track any of my information, which is kind of cool that Twitter gives you some ability to go in and, and deactivate things. And I went in and I deactivated everything I could. Um, and then I just started getting random ads. And I, and I like noticed how bad it was. I was like, this is, this is like really bad. I'm just like, when the internet doesn't know what you like, it just shows you all of the worst stuff, the most uh, provocative, you know, just like, and, and so I was like, oh man, maybe I should undo this and let Twitter start tailoring ads for me again. Um, so, I, you know, that being said, <laughs> the, the, if, if, uh, if, if, if I can just add something, yeah. I think to what Poppy was saying, yeah. um, I, I think that there is this conundrum with most technologies, right? You have a lot of positives and then you have a negatives. I think um, a lot of the things that we want to do now is bring those conversations and, and involve people that are not part of the narrow cognitive science side that can have part on how you can legislate uh, and establish certain conditions when it comes to this type of technology. Why? Because let's say we're just going into a plain VR game, right? And I have been dealing with some addiction, uh, cigarettes, uh, soda, you name it. Uh, advertisements can trigger uh, this kind of things, which will lead someone to a relapse, not knowingly. Um, so how do you begin to incorporate this information that can trigger someone for, because they're just trying to sell something, not knowing that this person might have to, might be dealing uh, with some, uh, uh, um, some sort of addiction and they're working through that. Similarly, you could use that same scenario in which the technology is aware of my addiction and begins to block certain distance because it knows that this will trigger something, right? Yeah. So the moment that you be, if we just have this conversation between uh, deep learning community and uh, then the neuroscience community, you have one answer. But if you begin to bring all these other sides, uh, then you start to have into like, okay, where are the risks? Where are the challenges? What are the steps? And you have a much richer um, conversation than Nana is completely biased by a perspective or by a, some sort of um, ideology or want to to make money or what or not. So I think that's the advantage in which we are right now, where a lot of these things are still early on. They're not super effective. It requires a lot of work to get into a certain point. But if it's one time to do that, it's now. And, and I think that's this type of forum kind of brings those perspectives. Uh, and uh, I think that, that's kind of like where I see this uh, conundrum. Guillermo, that, I mean, I'll just say, I, 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 I'm noticing a lot of chat comments about people thinking, you know, concern. <laughs> there, neural marketing has been around for a, quite some time. And, you know, I think there, the ethical issues about neural marketing are important to consider, but the, it's, it, if you think about, I, I think our points, uh, Guillermo, and uh, at least my perspective is we need a lot more legislation around our data and our personal signatures. I, you know, I believe not just legislation of technologies um, to enable agency. My voice right now carries with it through analysis of my voice. I can pull out diagnostics on many health conditions. There are companies that look at sentiment. You can predict if someone's likely to have a psychosis invoice. And the fact that you can do all of these things, it's you know one of the beautiful study that Connor went through, which I think is really interesting data. There are some important conditions that aren't in there, which are like my employer. 
my, you know, what, how data, the dimensionality of data has very, is very different dependent on who is using it and when they're using it and how they're using it. And okay. it's also very powerful for me if it's working for me. But if I don't have the infrastructure in place for that system of trust, which is built on technology, I need, you know, for voice, I need to have speaker diarization, I need to have, you know, the, you know, have the right analytics and featureization that I control when those things are happening right at the moment of capture. Right, that is technology being built to support legislation and the legislation being written around the technology. Similarly with neural data, it has huge positive applications, but it's how it's used, when it's used and making sure people understand these things can happen because that's how you get to a positive um, direction. So, so you're that, arguing, yeah. go ahead. I, I was gonna say to add to that, you know, like I think this has come up a couple of times, which is like, I mean, I think the two main points here are transparency and agency, right? Like we need to understand how it's working Yep. And then we also need to know that we, as the users of technology, have ultimate control over the way these feedback loops are getting optimized, right? And right now, in the current, you know, present day and age, that's not the case at all. Like when you're in, when you're in Facebook and you're on a news feed and, and content is getting optimized for you, we have, we have no idea what's happening under the hood. We just, we just know that it is happening. Right. But, but some people do. I mean, I mean, so targeted advertising, you know, is <laughs> I rely on it, right? And, and my, one of my best stories is someone on my team who absolutely abhors targeted advertising. Sorry, this is an anecdote. But the the one time he clicked on an ad from Facebook, he bought a cabin in the woods. Not not <laughs> that sounds. Weird, but he bought a house basically, and it led to <laughs> lots of positivity and emotional benefit to him. And, you know, would he have ever found it, you know, connected to it, you know, it led to, you know, emotional relationships, things that are very positive. And, you know, the point is, it's the you know, people who understand machine learning, you understand where data is coming in, how it's being used, how it's shaping that. You also understand somebody else has a different worldview. You have that transparency. You know, then you look at it, it's, you know, I guess I come from a perspective, so many things manipulate my mind. Rock is a master manipulator. Art is a way of manipulating my mind for positive or gain. And when you think about data as being what shapes us and you look at algorithms and you understand how that, where that's coming from, it, it's, it's about the transparency and Connor said it exactly right. Transparency and agency to know how I turn it off, when I turn it off, and also then empathy or uh, un, a representation of someone else's perspective and how different that can be. And knowing that I think really anchors a lot of improved conversations and dialogues. Yeah. Cool. Um, oh, sorry, go on, Kif. I, you, know, I, I'll... Uh, you know, I've got a follow-up question. Trace uh, in, the, in one of the uh, attendees is asking, you know, do you guys, and this is a question for all the panelists, uh, what are some tactics that you guys are formulating to alleviate some of these concerns that are also in the chat of, you know, consumer and user concerns from brain informed in advertising? And, and Trace also asks, you know, are you proposing an alternative method of monetization here? Um, I can just talk from a very narrow perspective of my work. This is a very broad question, right? There are many sides to that that you can break down and talk about each one of them. But uh, in my, for my type of applications, I'm looking into, into um, understanding that if I'm working with someone, if we're trying to make an application for a specific case, I think BCIs are used broadly for people with a, um, uh, some sort of um, uh, maybe limitation, might, they don't, might not have complete motor uh, 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 activate, they might not be able to control uh, any type of gaming device. So we come up with different modalities so that they can use them, or uh, we're trying to empower and give certain things that are not present within VR, like facial expressions and so on, right? So if we just look at a very narrow example, uh, and you look where the data is going. So right now, if you're trying to do anything, your data goes into some server, any client, any, any software that you're using, you don't know what's happening. You get some response with some label and so on. So now there's like these new modalities that I one here created here at the Media Lab that is called split learning. Well, your raw data never leaves your device. 
stays in the device. There is a layer, which is called the cut layer, where you create your gradient, you can get some uh, weights, and that is being passed into a server that has a larger model that is being used from anonymized data. So none of your personal data is being transferred into that. And you just get some uh, larger version, more general with your data into that. So your privacy is staying within your device, right? So your raw data is now being shared. So that's just like one example of approaching in, uh, different modalities and how you can begin to leverage the new models to do some sort of classification and inference into uh, into any modality that you're trying to create because that's kind of like the majority of uh, applications that you're trying to come up with some sort of classification, you need to use some sort of machine learning model in order for, for that to work. And that's where a lot of the uh, privacy concerns come into play. So I think for me, it's just kind of like, how do you keep that one level of privacy local in uh, um, uh, joining uh, or giving away my raw data? So the, I would say though, a, a kind of counter argument to that though, is that the raw data isn't really the valuable data. And I would say that sometimes companies will use like, oh, we delete your raw data as a, as a means of like a PR bonus. But really what they care about is the profile that they're building of you, which is metadata. It's not the raw data, it's your emotion. It, that's very different, that's very different. But, but what I'm saying is like, I wouldn't just, I wouldn't just take someone's like, word for we're deleting your raw data as a as like a, oh they must not be doing anything but, unethical but this is but, different yeah right well I'm, yeah I, I just the i think that there there is metadata that is much more valuable than raw data is is i guess the point i'm trying to make of, of course public. of course yeah. i mean that's what facebook is making all this money i mean there's a precedent one yeah. thing i just want to say because I, I can see a lot of you know uh, excitement in the in the chat and and this goes in different directions. <laughs> we anticipate it. Um, you know, one for neural marketing that's used. You know, that is always transparent to a user, and they're always participants in the lab and understanding. You know how that data is being used, and often it what 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 it you know. And again, the you know that a lot of that work came from Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and and has been proliferated in in different different directions. There's, you know, interesting articles that you can find online from Harvard Business Review and such. Um, but it's led to it, you know, it's just one example, but in all of the things we're talking about in terms of empowering people, it, you know, the reason why you want to solve privacy and data, and the answer is not you know, going to be the successful answer for everyone on the, you know, for at least many people on this call cannot be that, you know, I, I keep my data, I decide when my data is shared. I want, you know, because it keep where it's stored is what matters, what is stored, how it's, you know, how it's managed, how I control that agency is important because without personalization, you know, the solutions Connor and Graham and Guillermo are building are really critical for breaking, breaking out of one size fits all technology solutions. So right now for myself, if I put it on a VR headset, and I try to listen to audio and I, you know, and I listen to, you know, I, a headphone you know, or, or even, uh, you know, directional transducers like in the Oculus Quest or whatever, the, the information, these technology solutions are, are based on models that are usually, that, that don't know my body size, don't know my hearing, don't know if I, how, what my cognitive success is at that moment, don't know how I'm emotionally reacting to some of Guillermo's points where knowledge of this can be used to help me be in a better place, help me be more successful, help me not go in places that I don't want to go. Agency, to Connor's point, is critical, but it, it's like personalizing technology is a really important part of moving forward and getting out of technology always being built for white men. And that is really, and sorry, that, but I mean, it is, you know, it, we have a legacy and this is how, you know, in many cases, you know, if a technology is being successful, is by understanding the cognitive attentional capability of the technology's interaction with the human. I really, oh. I really like your point, you know, about the personalization and how like, you know, we, we are for better or worse trending towards this future where technology, you know, when it comes out of the box, it's going to be mapped. The, the app, the, the interface itself is going to be mapped to a human distribution where like, this is the average human. Hopefully yeah. it's not like the average white man. Hopefully it's a little bit more diverse than that. But like, you know, the 
here it is out of the box. Here's your distribution. Here's maybe multiple dimensions of distributions. You put your device on, it starts to learn the way that you're interacting with it. And it starts to bias these distributions away from the mean or the average towards you as an individual, right? And this is the kind of under, underlying themes of your idea of this kind of empathetic technology is this thing that kind of changes and grows with you, which I think is su super, super, super cool. But it also, you know, that's, that's, you know, if you're not in control of the way that it's growing and changing with you and also changing you at the same time, that's a very, very scary future. Right. And I, you know, I, this came up earlier in the call. I'm going to share one more little image because I've, I've used this diagram a number of times in various talks, but I think it's a good, um, can you guys see it? All right. Um, Basically, you know, like this is the diagram I like to use to describe where we're at and where we're going with this kind of closed loop, you know, computing future. Today, we're in this very kind of conscious relationship with our technology where we have active inputs, you know, and we, we can tell the computer various things with a keyboard or, you know, with our mouse or, you know, speech to text or whatever. And then we have conscious feedback where we get notifications, analysis, reminders, et cetera. You know, but where we're what we're heading towards is this future where more and more of this back and forth is becoming subconscious, like the outer loop of this diagram, right? And that's like the subconscious input, i.e., multimodal BCI, you know, sensors, you know, the where you're looking on a screen, what buttons you're clicking, etc., and then the subconscious feedback. So the neuromodulation, and you know, a lot of times neuromodulation, people think this is electrical, but actually, you know. A VR headset is an incredible neuromodulation device because we have, you know, you know, extremely immersive audio visual experiences with varying frame rates, varying volume that are incredible uh, uh, tools for changing the way someone's thinking and feeling, right? And so, you know, I think there are there are two paths that humanity could take. You know, one one path, and you know, we're probably going to end up somewhere in the middle, but like. You know, one path is this little robot over here, this little AI, you know, kind of embedded system inside of our computers. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but I'm waving it around on the little robot face. You know, we, we have very little control over that. And the two, you know, those applications and those tools are happening, you know, under the hood, black box. We have no idea how, the, how, how this loop is getting optimized and changed. I think the much better future is where we have complete control over the way that these loops are being optimized, right? And I, I like to or think or that we can trust the robot. We can trust yeah. the little AI, right? Is that we know that they're acting in our interest because they're not built on an advertising and sales model to try right. and trick us into doing things that we wouldn't voluntarily want to do. Exactly. Great point. Right. I, you know, I, yeah. I like I, like I use this the you know Jiminy Cricket. Uh, you know, I, I kind of like uh, I think that you know, this little robot, this little embedded AI, this construct that we're, we're working towards should be this little, you know, our little conscience, our little embedded computer, uh, Jiminy Cricket, that is working for us and trying to improve our lives and trying to improve our mental health and, and make sure that we're not getting addicted to technology and that we are, you know, becoming better versions of ourselves, not, not worse versions of ourselves. Um, you know, I'll stop sharing there because I think the diagram, uh, you know, across, but yeah, um, you know, yeah, for sure. I would love, I would love if, if you know, uh, if my computer could understand my mental state and when it delivers me notifications. I keep going back to notifications because that's something someone else controls that really affects how I feel. Um, <laughs> uh, so I want to move back into, uh, you know, you mentioned VR and and the possibilities here. Marco is asking. You know, using EEG, uh, what kinds of interactions do you think you guys can generate now? And are there examples or studies of, of you know, these interactions? He asked, you know, could you uh, manipulate a 3D cube in Unity? You know, are these, are these realistic things we can do right now with these kind of sensors? I'll be honest, and this may come as a surprise to some people listening. Um, I think that EEG is bad. By itself it's and especially for controlling things like if, if you're trying to move objects in space and manipulate things actively eeg is not a good tool for that you know there there are a very there's a very small subset of humanity that would benefit from that utility 
you know, and, and it's people who are quadriplegic or, or have motor, motor degenerative disabilities who are locked in, you know, and I, I'd say like in 999 out of a thousand cases, or maybe even higher percentage than that, you know, EMG and other types of interfaces are going to be more reliable for interaction. And that's going to, that's going to be the case into the infinite. Right. And I, and I think that like, where EEG is interesting is for passive BCI. And I, you know, Graham brought this up earlier. He used the word passive or he used the word active to describe the type of system that Muse was building just to give context, you know, like when we say active BCI, we mean like real time controlling things, moving objects in space, where, whereas passive BCI is this idea of monitoring the brain or monitoring the mind, you know, in the context of experience and trying to have that inform future experience or try and give some guidance to the user about how they can change what they're doing. Um, you know, and I think that EEG is much more interesting for passive BCI. Um, and well, I also think that, yeah. Let, let me just make an, uh, a different perspective argument in which, yeah, you can think of VR as a gaming application where you need to interact with something in, in a certain way, right? You needed to make something pop or push something. And, and I think a lot of this idea, can EEG uh, help you do this? a lot of things? There's a lot of questions. There is like things like uh, the P300 or uh, any other type of spellers that can kind of do similar condition where you can interact. But uh, at least for my type of work and the things that I'm interested in, it's more like, okay, we know that virtual reality can put the subject or a person in a specific space in which reality becomes part of the experience. It's not like I'm seeing a screen, right? So no matter what you show me in the screen, I know I'm in the office. I'm not in, in, the, uh, in the desert or in a dark room. I don't, I don't have that experience. VR can get you 80% there. So then if we begin to record brain signals and we start to look some of these relationships, synchrony, the synchrony between alpha powers or any of the power bands, then you can start to analyze and explore different areas of cognitive processes that normal means are, they don't allow you to do that because you cannot get into that mindset. So I, that's kind of like the side that I were, uh, at least my work comes in where, um, how do you bring this from the HCI community, the human computer interaction or the neurocognitive uh, um, side of things that can kind of begin to influence and be more enriched and look at a lot of the things that have been explored for many years in a much more controlled way. So we were talking about earlier, what can you do in the closed loop? Just imagine you have a phobia and you've been working with some uh, with a, a doctor to kind of like uh, build some sort of resilience into your phobia. But now you have a model, you have a system that understands your response to this phobia and automatically based on your own response and in your progress, the model is adapting and knows how much they can push so you can develop more resilience or push back because it's overwhelming you. So these are some of the things that within the VR, the Unity and Unreal world uh, becomes very powerful in tools like Galia. So yeah, so moving a little bit more from just gaming into other conditions. Cool. So they were I'm, having more fun the control. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm not nearly as as pessimistic as as Connor. I think on EEG, um, but I do think that um, you know there is a there are some real challenges. So I'm gonna I'll get to this demo in a, in a second. Um, but uh, there are some real challenges to um, finding ways to make BCI useful. So um, one way to think about active versus passive BCIs is you know Connor I think talked about voluntary control versus having something that changes. Um, passively. Another way to think of it is fast and slow, uh, which is actually how we got uh, the name System 2 for our company was, you know, Dan Daniel Kahneman's concepts of fast and slow cognition, System 1 and System 2. Um, so we, since we were working on this slow BCI, we thought, hey, this works, System 2. Uh, so the, the, um, the challenge with active BCI, especially with EEG, is um, you're always going to be competing, not with another BCI, but with, with users' hands. So you can do a lot with your hands. You can do a lot with a joystick. You can do a lot with a mouse. The, the, the comparator, except in cases of locked-in syndrome or paralysis, the comparator for a BCI is the user's ability to move things you know, using another electronic device. And it's very, very difficult for EEG to get enough degrees of freedom to control something in a useful way. 
Um, Alex Barishant, who's one of the control labs uh, senior scientists put it best. He said, you know, you build an EEG BCI uh, and somebody uses it for 10 minutes and thinks it's really cool. And then they ask for their keyboard and mouse back. Uh, so it, it's not to say it's, it's useless. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of covert processing. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of insights you can derive from this to adapt an interface. Um, especially things that users aren't themselves aware of, like what they're noticing and what they're not noticing and whether how their attention is fluctuating and, you know, different cognitive states and EEG microstates. And there's lots of great work going on in the field. Uh, so I think that their EEG has a long lifetime ahead of it in BCI, uh, in wearable BCI, just not in voluntary active BCI control. I think that one is going the direction of uh, eye tracking and EMG. Um, one example of the kind of thing we're sort of building toward is taking the information, uh, for example, in VR. So you can see this is on our website. This is my co-founder, Sam, who's playing a racing game and he's driving along. And you can see um, one of the neat things about FNIRS, this uh, imaging modality that we've brought into um, our wearable, uh, is that it, in real time, you can see that the signals are very big and the signal to noise ratio is higher than EEG, even though it's slower. So when you put it over the prefrontal cortex, you can really see when so what someone's mental workload is or their cognitive load is. Uh, now this has some applicate, lots of applications in gaming and in user experience research, but it also, for example, has applications in education uh, or in even in like in prosthetic fitting. So for example, if you're fitting a hearing aid and you want to know how much mental effort someone is having to to uh, exert in order to process sound and how long it's taking them, so you can use reaction time as one proxy for that. You can use, you know, how many, how much of their mental resources is in the prefrontal cortex is being used to process sound uh, when they are, when it's a degraded sensory experience. The same for vision. Uh, or if you are working through educational problems, math problems, or things like that, educational VR, uh, this is a very powerful tool for figuring out where someone is helping to figure out where someone is struggling uh, and to focus on those parts of the educational process and the learning process so that you can optimize them. Graham, quick question. Yeah, I, that's a great summary. I, 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 I'm curious because you know when you you brought up sound and you brought up cognitive load, which was what I was I was starting with with the hearing aid and use of EEG as a well, but so in the same way our hands you're competing against, which is a great a, a great um, um, uh, image for what you know we have to work against in terms of uh, deciding a BCI has actually improved made an improvement in someone's life and quality of life. Um, you know, it's when it's then the dual task, the ability, you know, like in what settings when I'm driving, my hands are busy. So at that point in time, I'm in a condition where my hands are doing something else, where a BCI might be informative for me to do things that don't take my time, don't take my hands away, but allow my attention to be in different directions or, you know, in settings where my hands are otherwise occupied. But the question I would ask you is, in measuring cognitive load and something in my prefrontal cortex, I would say it's got to be better than what I can get from dilation of my pupil for cognitive load. Like I can pick that up maybe much That's easier. Exactly right. For cost and yeah, as a metric for BCI or so. Uh, so I think this is this this comes back to um, you know the advantages of Galia and and to, certain, to a certain extent our our system as well, but also in combination with eye tracking. Um, this is really where multimodal BCI and multimodal interfaces uh, really sort of shine. So, you know, you can do a lot with, with uh, pupillometry. You can do a whole lot with eye tracking. Um, mm. You can do something with EEG. You can do something with FNIRS. Uh, but ultimately, interfaces in the future are probably going to merge together and bring, uh, you know, for example, it's very difficult to imagine that, that um, and we can get a little bit to, uh, this leads into what Guillermo is working on. It's very difficult to imagine an AR or VR future where uh, people's avatars can't smile and, and uh, exert facial expressions. So Absolutely. it's very important to have that kind of EMG around the eyes so, and eye tracking so that people know, you know, we're a big part of our brain is evolved to, to detect and follow the gaze of other people. And unless we have that in VR, people aren't gonna stick around and it's not gonna get adopted. So these are all problems that have to be solved as part of uh, designing and, and merging together and building better interfaces. So of course, you know, cool. uh, I'm sure I'm sure some of you guys saw this, but we did our announcement yesterday, and then two hours later, um, uh, Facebook announced their multimodal interface for AR, and they're working on bringing these technologies together too. So we're not alone in doing this. Not just OpenBCI, not just System Two, but there are a bunch of other 
uh, groups working on integrating these different modalities. Absolutely. Guys, uh, uh, panelists, I, you know, I, this was getting really good. I want to keep it going, but we have to close it out here. Uh, I really hope that we can pick up this debate in person sometime in the, in the coming months, for sure. Uh, Connor, do you have anything um, that, that you want to toss us off with? I do. And for everyone that stuck around, I want to do uh, something kind of cool. Uh, this, this is the first public reveal of a Galia prototype that we've done yet. I have sitting right next to me, one of the very first Gallia Alpha units. So as you can see here, um, this is you know still very much a prototype, but we have a high density uh, facial interface and um, some, some really swanky custom active electrodes in the, in the strap apparatus as we call it there. Uh, but that's the first time that we've ever shown that publicly. Uh, a lot more on that to come. Um, we, we have some big announcements coming in the next month uh, related to the beta program. Um, but yeah, I want to wrap it up just by saying um, thank you to my fellow panelists and Kif for, for kind of leading the conversation. And thank you to all the attendees for coming um, and participating today, taking an hour out of your time and, and, and joining us. Uh, this has been an awesome conversation. I wish we could keep going. Maybe we have to do a follow-up, uh, you know, some point in the near future. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone. And, and I, I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your Wednesdays. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everyone. for having us. Bye, guys. Yeah.